Welcome back. So we're switching gears to the environment, looking at what's happening. There's been predictions of rains, um, not just the rains, the floods. I mean, 2022, we had um, floods across the country and a lot of property was destroyed and then farmlands were destroyed as well. So um, over a million people were displaced. And some lives were lost in the course of those floods. But now there's been this prediction that it's going to happen again. What do we do? What's causing this flood? To look into this with us, we have an environmentalist, Dr. Paul Abolo. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Nielsa. Uh, well, thank you for having welcome, me. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Dr. Abolo, the floods is like a perennial. We, ha we get this every year. We get floods every year. Sometimes they say it's the dam that was opened in the Cameroons that flow down and caused the floods. But other times, it just, whenever there are rains, we have places flooded here in Nigeria. Um, let's start with what exactly causes this flooding year in year out? All right, um, flooding is caused uh, by a primary cause and you have a secondary cause. The primary cause is climate change, like we know, uh, intense precipitation and um, heavy rainfalls. But the secondary cause has to do with uh, anthropogenic effects, what I mean man-made to a large extent, like you talked about, the dams being opened up. Then the channels, natural water channels, are uh, clogged. Uh, people build indiscriminately across um, the water channels. And uh, behavior to how we manage our waste, which ends up uh, in, the, in the drainage. Uh, so those are the secondary effects. Um, do you want to hear more about the impacts? Uh, yes, the impact is heavy on our lives and livelihoods on farms. People are displaced. Um, economy is, uh, is being disrupted. And um, yesterday I heard in the news um, about a young boy who died uh, carried away by the flood. So it's huge. And here we come again, we are talking about flood. So the question is, what are we doing and what are we doing differently? Intra that, uh, that's precisely where I want us to go because last year we saw the disruptions that it had on f on farms, on farmers' lives, on food production, on even the economy in general. Because at some point, um, energy was also affected in the northern part of the country. Fuel couldn't get here as a result of you know the country being cut in two somewhere in Lokoja. Uh, you know, the, the Kogi state was uh, experienced very severe floodings as well. It was floods that we haven't seen from what we understand, since 2012, Bielsa was literally underwater. Uh, so I I'm wondering, what should we be doing differently? Because we have been warned by Naimet that the rains are coming and that they're going to come, uh, you know, torrentially this time around. Uh, we don't know, you know, whether we're going to have the same kind of flooding situation, but what should we be doing with this sort of predictions? Absolutely. Um, we, uh, Naimet is doing well with early warning uh, information and uh, but what do you with the information you need to do two things one you need the tools and you need the actions so let's just look at um, climate action climate action talks about mitigation and adaptation so there are two things we need to do mitigation is to reduce um, the cost of the problem while adaptation is to reduce the impact of the of the problems. So uh, with mitigation, we need to look at uh, the basic things. One, the dam. You know, they are going to release water from the dams again. Uh, we are not intentional about what we need to do to stop the water from causing the havoc and devastation. We need to build buffer dams. We need to do something different. Number two, we need to also desilt the rivers. The rivers are not as uh, deep as they used to be. So number three, we need to look at behavioral changes. How do we manage our waste? You know, I'll give you a quick example. Um, I was in the boat and the guy finished drinking water and he threw the bottle away. I said, stop, pick it up. And he was locked. I said, if you don't pick it up, I'll arrest you. When he had arrest, he stopped and picked it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we now began to talk about behavior and behavioral changes. I said, this that you've done here, will also increase the impact of flooding in our areas. He understood it and he took the lectures. So we have to do something with the information. Now on the adaptation end, it's not enough to just get the news and get the warning. We need to be intentional about what we do. What do we do? Do we build buffer dams? 
I haven't heard that been talked about. I just hear about the flood is coming. But what has the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, what are they putting in place? What structures are we putting in place? We are aware that people are building across the natural waterways. There are structures that are there right now that shouldn't be there. What are the actions that have been taken to remove those structures? Uh, I haven't heard about um, massive distilting of the rivers. I know yesterday I heard Dr. Magalo talking about um, um, doing some work in dredging some rivers, but that needs to be undertaken at a huge level. So it's not just enough to say the rains are coming again. Mm. They're coming again. What are you doing? Mm. So you're just sitting and waiting for the rains and the devastating impacts to hit you. Of so all the three items, I mean, when you spoke about mitigation, building buffer dams, the silting, the rivers, and behavioral change, it would seem that, you know, when you list them in that, in that order, oh, well. I know that the, the way, the easiest one would be to, to do would be the third one. Uh, maybe not the easiest, but at least it's somewhere where we can start. It's because, reachable. Yes, it's reachable. It's a low-hanging fruit, if Absolutely. we're serious about it. Yes. Uh, but if you t talk about buffer dams, you now begin to talk about long-term projects. Uh, it, it might not be realized for this particular in the uh, yes in the immediate so and then they still in the rivers um, how big a deal is that because it's something I've been, they've been speaking of for a while we've been talking about dredging our rivers we've been talking about uh, making them you know possible even for uh, for, for, for vessels, vessels to yes. be able to navigate and you know carry cargo to other parts of the country why is it so difficult for us to desilt our rivers uh, no the technology is there so it's not difficult is the will. The difficulty lies in the will to do it, not that the technology is not there. It's, it's a simple technology. And there are other huge benefits from doing that. Like you said, the vessels can move, we won't have the flood. By the time you look at the, the consequences of the impacts of the flood, you will find that um, if you put this on the balance sheet, it's cheaper to desil the rivers than to deal with the impacts. One life loss is a whole lot too much. Um, last year, we had over 600 people died, um, 2.4 million people, um, 2,400 people were injured, uh, 1.4 million people were displaced. That is huge. Agriculture was impaired. Over 320,000 hectares of land was affected. Over 500,000 hectares of farmlands were destroyed. And you know what that's doing to our nation? 19 million people are facing food security challenges. Over 14.7 million children are faced with malnutrition as a result of this. As an, I mean, yeah, and it's, it's so inter interesting you talk about malnutrition because that's where we started our conversation from this morning. Uh, but look, as an environmentalist, are you concerned that when it comes to matters of the environment, we seem to be more like a discicle? It, it, it doesn't appear that we understand the impact uh, you know, that we all have on the environment and, you know, how the environment is also impacting. This is, this is basic social studies we learned <laughs> in JS1. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, aren't you, are you, are you not alarmed as to how we're taking matters concerning the environment with levity? Well, that takes us to the number three point, behavioral change. Um, people don't know. When people don't know, they cannot actually cooperate with you. So back to one of the things I've always advocated, apart from the social studies, climate education in schools is very important uh, from the primary level to the secondary levels. Climate change has become such a big issue it, it affecting our lives and livelihoods that you must add it into the curriculum. People need to know. And then when the children learn about climate change at school, they'll teach their parents at home. It hasn't been done yet. No, <laughs> it hasn't yeah. been done. Uh, Dr. Paul, let me... Yes. Marquez talked about the low-hanging fruit, yeah. which is sensitization, and government says they've started sensitization. We saw that in the news, that they've started sensitization around the flood, uh, flooded, potentially floodable areas. Yes. But let's look at the other part about dredging. I mean, if we go all the way back to 2006, contracts were awarded, for instance, to dredge the Calabar port. Um, in 2018, contracts were awarded to dredge, I think, Worry, in 2018. In 2022, contracts were awarded to dredge River Niger and River Benue. Um, in 2023, um, a former head of the NPA comes out to reveal that she was fired because of a certain um, dredging contract. So 
these dredging contracts have been awarded over time. Let's just say from 2020, mm -hmm. 2006, when up till now, contracts awarded, dredging not done, or desilting the river channels not done. And we know that that's one of the fastest way to reduce flooding. What should government be doing if indeed there's that interest in ending the flooding situation we seem to experience every year? So that brings me back to um, my discussion with Mark earlier. The will. You know, we, we need to establish the will to do it. We need to understand um, the impact of flooding on lives and livelihoods. We need to understand the severity of flooding. We need to understand um, um, the impacts on critical infrastructure. So it's not enough to award the contracts. I don't know what happened with the contracts, but we need to ensure that the contracts are implemented. Mm. So, viewers, I mean, <laughs> maybe not just any kind of viewer, but people are curious to know about weather reports. I mean, yes, we have the yearly predictions that NIMED gives, but on a daily basis, I mean, most countries, even us here, we do a uh, weather report letting you know whether it to be rainy or sunny. Mm. But how can we put this weather report to better use for our daily lives? Yes, absolutely. The, the weather reports are given. Um, NIMET is doing a great job, um, Nigerian Hydrological uh, Agency yeah. Services, they are doing a great job, but it doesn't get to the grassroots. <laughs> the awareness needs to be broken down to the level where the people at the local government areas, at the communities, not only will they get the information, but they need to understand the impacts but we need to break it down in their languages. In their well. languages, too. And then they need to understand the impacts so they will see themselves in it. And that will bring us back to the behavioral change. So uh, we have the big news, we talk about it, talk the big numbers. How many people understand the numbers? People are more interested in the impacts on how it affects them, how it affects their lives and livelihoods how it affects their children, like the woman who lost her child uh, due to flood. That situation, that incident, though it's, it's not good, could be used as a tool, as a model, to communicate this to other people in the community, that somebody lost their child, their two-year-old child, to flood. Flood just carried, and the woman was just watching her child go. The fear of that will make people behave right and do what is right at the individual level. At the local government level, the local governments are responsible for putting uh, policies and structures in place. Um, we used to have um, sanitation once uh, a month. It looked like it was a mere exercise, but it was doing something. We need to reinforce it. We need to develop things more like that on a larger scale, starting from the uh, lower level, so that it will become part of our culture, part of our ways, part of the things that we do. We really need to deal with this problem. I'm telling you because it's increasing by the day. And uh, every year we hear it, it comes, it goes, it disrupts our economies, it disrupts our farms, uh, people, lives are lost. And then when it's gone, people start acting as if nothing ever happened again. Then a few months later, we say it's coming again. And people are waiting for it to come without anything being done. So it's, a, it's such a vicious cycle that um, you, need to, you just get tired of it. Something extraordinary needs to be done. Thank you very much. That's a good place to leave it, Dr. Abolo. We do hope that everyone heard and will do something about this matter. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. Paul Abolo is an environmentalist, and he was sharing his thoughts on what to do about the flooding situation that's been predicted. Again, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you for having me.